Okay, so first of all, hi, thanks so much for being here, and thank you to City Lights, and thank you to Peter. Um, this bookstore means so much to me, and thank you for the work you do as booksellers, and event coordinating, and writers would be nowhere without you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the rest of you. Um, so this is, I'm going to be reading from The Incendiaries. Um, it's my it's my first novel, and I, uh, so the usual, so you know, so, okay, so I was working on this book for, um, for 10 years, and during those 10 years, I went to a lot of parties and whatnot at which people would ask what I do, and I'd say I write, I work on a novel. And what I tell them is that I was at work on a novel that um, has to do with a woman who gets involved with an, a group that turns out to be an extremist cult with ties to North Korea. And that this cult um, eventually ends up bombing five US abortion clinics, healthcare clinics, in the name of faith. Uh, so that was the spiel I gave for you know ten years, um, and by far the most common autobiographical question I got, uh, and the f by far the most common question I got right after that was always like, "Is your novel autobiographical?" Um, which always deeply puzzled me because I think the only way to interpret that is everyone was asking if I was a domestic <laughs> terrorist, um, <laughs> if I'd blown up buildings, if I'd been in a violent cult. Um, and so the answer to all these questions is no, I haven't blown up any buildings just yet. Um, uh, but I thought I, I would just touch briefly on sort of what led to the novel and my, and my own obsessions and losses because there is a longer possible answer about um, the fact that I grew up deeply religious. Um, I was so religious that my entire life plan until I was 17 for a little while was to become a missionary or a preacher or like a religious recluse living in a cave. I don't know, I hadn't really like worked out, worked out the details. Um, <laughs> but I, then I lost the faith at 17 and it was, in a lot of ways, it was incredibly painful. Um, and so I was writing about that, and I think because of that, I've, I've become interested, and I've been interested, and I remained fascinated for the entire 10 years I was working on this book on the varieties of different people's definitions of good, of right, because um, part of what sets religious terrorists apart from other people who commit acts of violence is th that at least some of some people, and, and certainly my terrorists to some extent, my terrorists, um, they they believe they're doing good. They believe they're acting in the name of God, in the name of love. Um, so that is the bit of preamble. I'm just going to read from the first three chapters. So the novel alternates between three points of view: um, Phoebe Lynn, who's the woman who falls into the cult; John Leal, who's the cult leader; and Will Kendall, who loves Phoebe and. Um, grows to oppose everything that the cult stands for. One will. They'd have gathered on a rooftop in Knoxhurst to watch the explosion. Platt Hall, I think, 11 floors up. I know his ego, and he'd have picked the tallest point he could. So often, I've imagined how they felt, waiting. With six minutes left, the slant light of dusk reddened the high old spires of the college, the level gables of its surrounding town. They poured festive wine into big bellied glasses. Handshaking, they laughed. She would sit apart from this reveling group, cross-legged on the roof's west ledge. Three minutes to go, two, one. The Phipps building fell. Smoke plumed the breath of God. Silence followed, then the group's shouts of triumph. Wine glasses clashed together, flashing martial light. He sang the first bars of a Cheja psalm. Others soon joined in. Carolyn bells chimed, distant birds blowing white, strewn like dandelion tufts, an outsized wish. It must have been then that John Leal came to her side. In his bare feet, he closed his arm around her shoulders. She flinched, looking up at him. I can imagine how he'd have tightened his hold, telling her she'd done well, though before long it would be time to act again, to do a little more. But this is where I start having trouble, Phoebe. Buildings fell. People died. You once told me I hadn't even tried to understand. So here I am, trying. Two, John Leal. Once John Leal left Knoxhurst, halfway through his last term of college, he drifted until he ended up in Yanji, China. In this city adjacent to North Korea, he began working with an activist group that smuggled Korean refugees toward asylum in Seoul. He'd found his life's work, he thought. Instead, 
He was kidnapped by North Korean agents, spirited across the border, and thrown into a prison camp outside of Pyongyang. In the stories he later told the group, he said the gulag brutalities were bad enough, but at least they'd been expected. What astonished him was the allegiance his fellow inmates showed toward the lunatic despot whose policies had installed them in their cells. They'd been jailed because uh, they'd splashed a drop of tea on his new sprint portrait. A neighbor claimed to have overheard them whistling a South Korean pop song. Punished for absurdities, they still maintained that the beloved sovereign, a divine being, couldn't be to blame. At first, he assumed this was lip service, the prisoners afraid to say otherwise. But then, he thought of the refugees he'd met in Yenji, how they talked of loving the god they'd fled. They attributed the regime's troubles to anyone but the sole person in charge. A month into John Lyle's time in the Gulag, prison guards held an optional foot race, the prize a framed icon of the despot. In the confusion, those who fell were trampled. One child died of a broken spine. Through howls of pain, he shouted hosannas for his lord. They weren't lying, the poor fools. They believed in the man as one might believe in Jesus Christ. Some people needed leading. In or out of the gulag, they craved faith. But think if the tyrant had been as upright as his disciples trusted him to be, the heights he'd have achieved if he loved them, if, John Lyle thought, until his idea began. Three, Phoebe. I hoped I'd be a piano genius, Phoebe told the group in the first Cheja confession she tried giving. But I didn't just wait, she said. I expected, no, I wanted to work for it. I spilled time into the piano as I'd have put cash into a bank. I saw full concert halls in the future, solo recitals, front page plaudits. I practiced list while imagined spotlights, spotlights gilded the living room. Recollection is half invention, but it feels as though I spent my entire childhood training to prove I was the significant pianist I believed I'd be. So I piled up trophies. It wasn't enough. The teacher flicked my hands with the rod each time I didn't hit the right note, but I didn't mind. My ambition outstripped his. Let my hands swell. I could use the extra span. Bright knuckled, I tried again. The months ticked past, then years. I kept lists of rivals. I indexed others' exploits by age. Kiel, at five, had given his first recital to the Danish king. Orai, 11, debuted at Carnegie Hall. Liu, 15. One night, my teacher called Libick's etude number five the most challenging piece a soloist might attempt. It's eluded the finest pianist, he said. So I rushed to find the etude score. I learned it alone in secret. I memorized Libick's high trills. I flailed through wild ostinatos. Until then, nothing I played had evoked the Orphic singing I knew to be possible. It was an ideal I lacked the skill to bring to life. Each first place prize marked a point when I'd let the music down. With Libick, I failed less. His etude asked so much of me that at times I'd forget I had an eye. I should have learned from this that playing had to be birth in a place without ego, in which I didn't exist except as the living conduit, Libick's medium. But then, when I showed the teacher what I could do, he was astonished. I'd achieved more than he'd hoped, he said. He switched the piece in for the next competition, a city level open. I was driven to the recital hall. The sun fell on my hands as I practiced Libic again, fingers dancing across my legs. Spotlit, I listened to the traffic sing my name. The lax blue of LA, heat rippled, veiled the horizon. Like curtains, I thought, poised to rise. Thank you.